Welcome to day two of the McLean Festival. We have an amazing turnout, fantastic. Uh, more people here today than yesterday. Uh, since there are more people here than yesterday, I'm gonna, for the benefit of those who weren't here, I'll redo some of what I told you guys yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> brief history of this festival. Started in 2015, uh, held up in Sealy Lake, Montana, uh, to honor Norman McLean, who was obviously, he was he's one of the great 20th century American authors. He only published two books, uh, River Runs Through It and Young Men in Fire, both written uh, after he reached his 73rd birthday, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, it was a great festival. We had several hundred people. Uh, the following year, we extended it to include the actual movie and some of the people that were involved in the movie. Tom Skerritt was here. Uh, uh, both of Norman's children were here, uh, John and Jean. Uh, we had the executive producer, the screenwriter, and blah, blah, blah. A lot of different stuff. And some other uh, topics that branched off of that. 2019, uh, we expanded into uh, a lot of writers that wrote either inspired by him or wrote topics similar to the topics he was. It was very good. It then moved into Missoula because we are getting a bigger crowd. This year, I can't tell you how big this, this is great. Two days in a row of probably uh, over 700 people each day. Uh, <laughs> we thought one of the main reasons was this is the first year we opened at the public for free, uh, which is a natural assumption. But now it, the, the theme this year, public land and sacred ground, turns out to really have probably been the primary draw uh, and the list of incredible authors that, that came with it. Uh, the speakers we have are panelists who represent a who's who of contemporary literature of the American West. They've earned Academy Awards, Pulitzer Prizes, National Book Awards, and a lot of other prestigious uh, and recognitions of their extraordinary literary achievements. Uh, it's very impressive. We have a very exciting agenda, but before we get going, I want to take something that's not on our uh, agenda. Uh, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize uh, the effort the imagination, the energy, and professional expertise that it's taken uh, to put this together. Uh, Jenny Rohr, who is head of our group, uh, she, she's not only an, a, an acclaimed documentary filmmaker, which she is, uh, she's simply a force of nature. She's been unbelievable for the last 18 months. So I would ask Jenny, wherever you are, if you could come up here. <laughs> this is a surprise to Jenny, okay? I would like to uh, bring up uh, your, your reward. <laughs> and it's being brought up by Sarah Wilcox. The founder uh, of the festival. Who basically is one of the inspirations behind the festival and is the literary expert that assembled this incredible set of speakers and authors. So that plaque is for you. Jenny and Carol, these flowers are for you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I can't tell you how incredibly frustrating it is to work with them. <laughs> They're great. And, and there's, there's many other people scattered around here who have been working on this as well. Uh, no, uh, no 
they, we're, they don't get flowers, though. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, topic to, first topic is a burning testament, something deeper than hope. Uh, it's Terry Tempest Williams who will be providing that keynote address. Uh, <clears throat> who, by the way, was here yesterday, snuck in the corner, nobody knew it, and, and was blown away by yesterday. Very cool. <clears throat> uh, but I would like to have her introduced to you by Rick Bass. Uh, Rick Bass is not only a dear friend of Terry, uh, he's also an amazing author and a wilderness activist who lives in the remote Yak Valley of northwestern Montana. He's written numerous books about the West and preservation uh, and conservation, including Brown Dog of the Yak. One of his nonfiction titles, uh, Why I Came West, was a finalist for the National Book Award, or National Book Critics Circle Award. So with that, I'm sure many of you have heard of Rick, maybe met Rick. You're going to meet him again. Rick? Thank you, Jerry, and thank you for the reminder to give them hell. But since Terry's here, I think we'll say just give them H-E double toothpicks. Uh, you all already know Terry's writing. Uh, that renders an introduction irrelevant. But I, I do see this as an opportunity to talk about how, how cheesy she is. Y'all may not know that part about her. <laughs> she, she does in, indeed say uh, H-E double toothpicks. And uh, <laughs> she, she has these jokes that she thinks is funny. When she gets nervous, she'll ask them, uh, uh, where did Napoleon keep his armies? In, in his sleeveys. And uh, I mean, she, 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 like, she tells, she'll say it. Every year, just she doesn't stop. Uh, what do you call a bear without ears? A bee. Uh, you, you're so hungry to hear her, and you think she's a saint, and maybe she is. But what I want to share is, again, how delighted we are to have the cheesiness, the doofiness, the wonkiness, the dorkiness. The, uh, just, and this is from the same woman who is, will go jaw to jaw with Orrin Hatch or, or, uh, or Bruce Babbitt or, or the House Chair of the Appropriations Committee trying to stop the egregious Black Ram sale. Um, I'll tell you quickly how I met, how I met Terry. Uh, I've been believing that this thing that there's no more metaphor left. And maybe there never was metaphor. Maybe it's just a thing we made up to deal with the world. And, and it's being stripped away. I met her and Doug, uh, two dearest friends in the desert in southern Utah, almost 35 years ago. I ran out of gas. Uh, there was no more, there was, is no metaphor. Uh, she picked me up. I got in the car. I, I, I met Doug. It was a really good day. <laughs> Since then, Terry and I, Terry and Doug and I, have wandered the mountains in Uganda and Rwanda together, staring down at skeletons and mummified bodies that remain the signature of the genocide, stood next to immense gorillas living on the flanks of volcanoes. With Doug, we've walked on the banks of the Taku River in British Columbia, listening to grizzlies crunching the heads of salmon, and in the Galapagos, hiked up over a sand dune to behold a hundred or more pink flamingos, swam with seals that rushed at us and then blew explosions of silver bubbles at us so violently they peeled back our face masks, avoided narrowly being inhaled through the baleen of whale sharks. It's been said of Terry that one cannot have a simple lunch with Terry without shedding copious tears at one point or another, good tears, and yet to be in her presence, one would do well to hydrate beforehand. She is loyal. She is family. If Doug or I were to say we need her help, she would always take that call. Aldo Leopold said that to possess an ecological education is to be aware that we live in a world of wounds. Like, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> Terry's an inspiration to the young and the old alike, young women particularly in these hard times. I want to tell a real quick how I think of Terry. Uh, 
like up in, in British Columbia, you know, this granitic substrate right on the coast, uh, very, there's no organic material in granite. It's just, it's just fire that has cooled, and uh, yet there are grizzlies and salmon and old cedar forests up there, old growth forest, and those forests would not be there without the grizzlies eating the salmon and then carrying the protein from the salmon farther into the forest to deposit it, redistribute it, so to create soil that the cedars grow in and provide the shade to keep the streams cool to send the salmon, the young salmon back out into the ocean, wait whether they come back and the bears eat them. And, and we need everything. We need, uh, we need everything we've got. Um, and Terry doesn't, doesn't, I think of her as that nitrogen that comes in in the salmon that makes the forest grow and keeps the, keeps the bears alive. She doesn't live here, but her path comes through now and again, a signature, a rock solid warranting. When we need her most, she shows up. We all show up. Thank you all for showing up, telling the truth, telling the truth, telling the truth. Long ago, she asked, I need one of those Napoleon jokes. <laughs> Long ago she asked, how will I survive my affections? We don't. Thank you. Good afternoon. You know Rick is a great fiction writer. <laughs> Rick, I love you. And here's a story about Rick Bass that I have not shared before. And it is true. Uh, three years ago, my beloved brother Dan took his life. And I was in Jackson on the couch wondering how I was going to continue. The phone rang. I saw that it was Rick. And I picked up the phone. And he started telling me a story. He didn't ask how I was. He didn't say I'm sorry. He just said a story. He just started talking. And I, I didn't even understand what he was saying. The story made no sense. But it was the most comforting thing I had ever experienced. And he went on and on and on. And I was flat. And then I got up. He went on and on and on. And I went outside. And I started walking around the house. And in that time that he was telling me this nonsensical story that was the most true thing I had ever heard that went beyond words, in that time that he was telling me this story to get me up and out into the world again, I found 11 feathers from a great horned owl. Eleven was my brother's magic number. And by the time I came back in, I sat down, he finished his story, and he hung up. I love you. That's what stories do. They save our lives. And yesterday, we heard so many stories that I think were life-saving. Thank you, Jerry, for your elegance as our MC for this evocative and provocative gathering. I have to tell you it's a joy and privilege to be here with you in Missoula. And Rick's right, this is home ground for me. It is where I came of age with Northern Lights, the one place that I could get published with friends. It's the Clark Fork. It's everything you represent here. It's Barbara, Factor Fiction. I could go on and on and on. It's Dan Chemis. It's Deb Clout, it's friends and family and community. And I want to offer a special embrace of gratitude to you, Jenny, for your vision and care throughout this ambitious conference, a brave conference, and for your patience from holding your vision during the pandemic and bringing us back together now, and to all of the staff and volunteers who've made this possible, thank you. To be able to honor the work of Norman McLean is to live into the wisdom of his enduring words from a river runs through it. We can love completely what we cannot completely understand. 
These are challenging times, these are difficult times, and at times disorienting. But they're also thrilling times, loving times, because while we are breaking down, we are breaking through and reimagining and remaking the world. For me, these words perfectly convey our collective work together on behalf of public lands and sacred ground, no separation. We can love completely what we cannot completely understand as we listen, as we learn, as we grow. And I have to tell you, I have not spoken publicly in the West for maybe four years. So my heart is full and I'm nervous and sort of a wreck if you want to know the truth. <laughs> so I'm just going to try and get through this and um, I ask that you hold the space with me as we get through this together. I loved what Tim Egan said yesterday and it's such a deep, deep honor to be here among friends. I loved his spirit and solidarity how he more solidly within our shared and diverse histories of public lands, sacred ground, allowed us to feel more comfortable. At a time when we're not comfortable, I so respect both his ground truthing as a Westerner and the aerial view he possesses as the brilliant writer and journalist that he is, and how his voice has never forsaken his roots of his own home ground. Yesterday I found riveting, didn't you? from Rosalind Lapierre's admonition to, quote, erase pristine language, unquote, with the fact that wherever we are, these are indigenous lands where indigenous people have lived and managed them. How John Tolliver brought George Bird Grinnell to life yesterday in the complexity of his vision and his relationship with the Blackfeet in the Glacier story, awkward as it was with the panel held by Michael Punk. This, American is our, this America is Ours, moderated by Tim, was lively and enriching with the insights of Shane Morishow, as a respected Montana state senator and member of the Salish Kootenai tribe. As native people, he said, we are nomadic. We moved around our territory. It was over 20 million acres, which allowed for natural regeneration and remember when he said, in the name of reciprocity. John Clayton, with his refreshing take on Muir and Pinchot, dressed up as basketball players. <laughs> his book, Natural Rivals, reminds us that public lands have always had conflicts and a healthy tension. And Nate Schweber, in his riveting presentation of the Devotos, Bernard and Avis, who gave us a history of advocacy that many of us didn't know or had forgotten. From his watershed essays, Devotos, Easy Chair, The West Against Itself, and Shall We Let Them Ruin Our National Parks in the Saturday Post, to Kitchen Knives, and the hanging, what is that called? Um, where it's, it, the cliffhanger, um, when he left us with <laughs> Julia Child, and I can tell you, having read Nate's book, This America of Ours, it's both a page turner and a revelation, not only of a powerful partnership, but how love is the bedrock of change, public lands and sacred ground included. And then Onyx Smith, a hero of mine, a sister writer and dear friend, brought us to tears in her loving, honest, barebone tribute to her partner and our mentor, Bill Kittredge. Thank you, Onik. We not only remember Bill, his prophetic voice continues to resound and resonate among us far and wide in your relationship. This quote from Bill is on my desk. Quote, we tell stories to take, to talk out the trouble in our lives, trouble otherwise so often so unspeakable. It is one of our ways, main ways of making our lives sensible. Trying to live without stories can make us crazy. They help us recognize what we believe to be most valuable in the world and help us identify what we hold demonic, unquote. No nonsense, Bill Kittredge. Hole in the sky. Yes, yes, and yes. Onyx tribute was followed by the rich discussion on who owns the story, with Deborah Magpie Erling powerfully asking the question, why do non-natives need to tell our stories? Unquote. 
To feel her anger as sacred rage born out of justice and injustices sent me back to her book, Perma Red, that was searing for me. I found these words last night. I remember them. It is cold, she says. Snakes sleep in deep holes trapped by snow. We tell our stories now. Rattlesnakes are quiet. Rattlers are quiet. It is so far back your blood smells like oil in the tongues of your grandmothers." Unquote. 35 generations, more than. Mandy Smoker shared her generosities on the power of story and how it resides in the heart of community with grace and empathy and often dissent. She reminded me of the importance of listening. And Peter Stark spoke from the lens of history of Tecumseh's promise and the historian's attempt to portend the future from the past. Through this, throughout this conversation, Anik brought us back to the necessity and importance of having these tough conversations. We are evolving and we are eroding at once. Lastly, Sally Thompson with Shane Doyle and Joe Wagner brought us to the words we carry. The phrase I left with during that session was the power of indigenous peoples, quote, covenant with the creation, unquote. Why gestures matter, a story told, a ceremony held, communion with. Yesterday brought us here. So for the next 40 minutes or so, maybe less, I want to celebrate with my beloved brothers, Rick Bass and Doug Peacock, with Tracy Stone Manning, Shane Doyle, Ram, Rob Cheney, and John McLean this afternoon. What I have to say may seem dark, but I don't view it that way. For me, it's about telling the truth. And I remember each time our family faced an illness um, due to nuclear testing from the Nevada test site, what made me crazy, what brought me down to a state of depression is when they lied to us when we heard that it was terminal, then we could breathe. We knew what we were up against. We were ready for it. And that's how I hope you to see my words or feel my words today. I'm just trying to tell the truth. And to me, that is a point of light. I wanna share with you three pieces that I've written in the last four years, really since the pandemic, just a little bit before to just show you where my journey has been and perhaps it mirrors your own. The first piece was written December 2nd, 2017, just before Donald Trump gutted Bears Ears National Monument. What is beauty if not stillness? What is stillness if not sight? What is sight if not an awakening? What is an awakening if not now? Like many, I've compartmentalized my state of mind in order to survive. Like most, I've also compartmentalized my state of Utah. It is a hidden violence that we all share. This is the fallout that has entered our bodies, nuclear bombs tested in the desert, boom. These are uranium tailings left on the edges of our towns where children play, boom. The war games played and nerve gas stored in the West Desert, boom. These are the oil and gas lines, frack lines from Vernal to Bonanza in the Uinta Basin. Boom. This is Anath and Montezuma Creek, the oil patches on Indian lands. Boom. Gut bear's ears. Boom. Cut Grand Staircase Escalante in half. Boom. And every other wild place that is easier for me to defend than my own people and species. Boom. The coal and copper mines I watched expand as a child, Huntington and Kennecott, boom. The oil refineries that foul the air and blacken our lungs in Salt Lake City, boom. And the latest scar on the landscape, the tar sands mine in the book cliffs closed, now hidden simply by its remoteness, boom. Add the Cisco Desert, where the trains stop to settle the radioactive waste they carry on to Blanding, boom. Move the uranium tailings from Moab to Crescent Junction, then bury it still hot in the alkaline desert, out of sight, out of mind, boom. See the traces of human indignities on the sands near Topaz Mountain, left by the Japanese internment camps, boom. President Donald J. Trump will try to eviscerate Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante monuments with his pen and poisonous policies. He will stand tall with other white men who for generations have exhumed, looted, and profited from the graves of ancient ones. They will tell you, Bears Ears belongs to them. Boom. 
This is a story, a patronizing story, also a condescending one. I see politicians and frontier Mormons, my people, discounting the tribes once again, calling them, quote, Lamanites, unquote, the rebellious ones against God, dark-skinned and cursed. That is their story. Racism is a story. The Book of Mormon is a story. Boom. Perhaps our greatest trauma living in the state of Utah is the religiosity of the Mormon patriarchy that says, as I was told growing up, that we had no authority. Women, Indians, black people, brown people, gay people, trans. It was only those who were white and male who could hold the priesthood over us, telling us the way to heaven is through them. All my life, I was told I could not speak, that I had no voice, no power, except through my father or husband or bishop, and then there was the prophet, boom. I refuse to perpetuate this lie, this myth, this abuse called silence. If birds had a voice, so did I. Environmental racism is a story, is the outcome of bad stories, a byproduct of poverty. In Utah, yellow cake has dusted the lips of Navajo uranium workers for decades who are now sick to dead. Boom. There is no running water in Westwater, a reservation town adjacent to Blanding. Local municipalities refuse to provide Navajo families with the basic right. Water. Boom. But we are not prejudiced. Boom. If you speak of these oversights, call them cruelties, we as Mormons are seen as having betrayed our roots and our people. These are my people. Boom. This is who I am. Boom. A white woman of privilege born of the covenant. I am not on the outside. I am on the inside. Boom. It is time to look in the mirror and reflect on the histories that are ours. We are being told a treacherous story that says it is an individual's right, our hallowed state's right, to destroy what is common to us all, the land beneath our feet, the water we drink, the air we breathe. It is a toxic story. Our bodies and the bodies of the state of Utah are being violated. Our eyes are closed, our mouths are sealed. We refuse to see or say what we know to be true. Utah is a powerful, beautiful violence. Do we say, dare to see Utah for what it is, an elegant toxic landscape where the power of oppression rules by repression, are proving grounds of fear? Here is my question, what are we afraid of? Exposure. Boom. Our denial is our collusion. We have a right and responsibility to protect each other. Resistance and insistence before the law. We are ignoring the evidence. We are ignoring our histories. Awareness is our prayer. Beauty will prevail. Native people are showing us the way. It is time to heal these lands and each other by calling them what they are, sacred. May a Congress of Raven greet us in ceremony. May we recognize our need of a collective blessing by earth. May we ask forgiveness for forgiveness for our wounding of land and spirit. And may our right relationship to life be restored as we work together toward a survival shared. New stories are awakening. We are part of something so much larger than ourselves an internet connected hole that stretches upward to the stars. Coyote in the desert is howling in the darkness, calling forth the pack, lifting up the moon. I remember meeting with Willie Gray Eyes, who is Diné, and at the time, chair of Utah Diné Bikea, shortly after Bears Ears National Monument was gutted, cut in half. We were having dinner in Bluff, I was ranting, and he said, Terry, it can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. What does healing look like? Willie showed us the way. Not long after we spoke, he filed a suit against the state of Utah and San Juan County for improper racial gerrymandering. He won the case. The open space of democracy prevailed. When the open space opened, 
Willie stepped in, and he ran for county commissioner of San Juan County, one of the largest counties in the United States. He was met not only with resistance, but accusation. <coughs> they said that Willie Gray Eyes, who has lived for generations at the base of Navajo Mountain, was not a resident of Utah. <laughs> not only that, but they questioned his residency as an American. It went to court. I was there at the trial. It was packed. There were maybe four Native people that were allowed in. The rest were white, frontier, Mormons, many of my relatives. Willie's defense, when asked by the attorney, what is your proof that you are a resident of Utah? And Willie's response, my umbilical cord is buried here. You can imagine how that landed in that audience. Everyone laughed, everyone guffawed, and he said, let me ask you again, what proof do you have that you are a resident of the state of Utah? And Willie said, my umbilical cord is buried here. That was his defense. And for the next eight hours, we heard all the reasons why Willie was not a member, that he didn't have a house. That was one of them, that he had a girlfriend in Arizona, that he lived with his daughters in Page. And when his daughters spoke, they said the reason why Willie doesn't have a house is because he lives in his car, because he's helping people with health care and education as a community organizer in Navajo country, Utah Navajo country. The reason why he lives in Arizona with us sometimes is because our mother died and he vowed to stay with us until we were on our own. The reason Willie belongs to Utah is because every chance he gets, he sleeps where his umbilical cord is buried. And then the trial was over. I wanna read you the decision. On Tuesday, January 29, 2019, Judge Don M. Torgerson, a conservative judge during the, appointed during the Trump era, gave his ruling from Utah's 7th District Court. Quote, Willie Gray Eyes is indeed a resident of San Juan County who lives on the Utah side of Navajo Mountain. The ruling goes on to say, quote, he is also from Paiute Mesa in the traditional sense he was raised there, his umbilical cord is buried there, and his family counts the area as their place of origin." Unquote. Judge Torgerson went on to write, he is connected to San Juan County as deeply as any resident of the county, in ways we can only hope to emulate. In practice, he has always participated in the voting process in San Juan County, and his rich cultural history adds to his connection. He is a patriot and he has always returned to the area and will always intend to return to the area when he has traveled away. When I asked Willie after the case how he felt, he said, it can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. And then he said, we're turning heads. Those heads are turning outward and helping us. Bruce Adams called me the other day after the big snow, Willie said. He's the non-Indian San Juan County Commissioner that Gray Eyes and Mary Boy serve with. And then he said, for the first time, Bruce called and said, hey Willie, how are your road conditions out there in Navajo Mountain? What's happening? How can we help? I told him it was an emergency situation. In some instances, a matter of life and death for some of our older people with food and medicines. And Bruce said, we'll be there. We had given up. Together we mobilized. We are eroding and evolving at once. December 4th, 2020. I am unraveling. I am unraveling like a rattlesnake in the desert, tightly coiled, my tail issuing a warning. I cannot yet decipher. My mind is unraveling as I move to free my thoughts from being held captive for too long 
in such a tensely wound space. For months, I've been in a defensive stance visible only to surrounding ghosts. Fear brought me here. Uncertainty brought me here. 250,000 dead from the coronavirus brought me here. I close my eyes and I see them. My capacity to strike from one emotion to the next frightens me. After isolating myself in a landscape of arid beauty for the past nine months during the global pandemic, why do I find myself in this process of unraveling now with the privilege that I have? What is waiting and wanting to come forth? We are unraveling in inexplicable ways, given how tightly and mysteriously the world is woven together. Pull one strand and all the strands are disrupted, threatening the integrity of the overall pattern. Perhaps we need a new pattern. Along with dictionaries, poets, scientists, children, and the land itself, I consult the dead. I hear my grandmother telling me to focus on, quote, the golden thread, unquote, that shows us the through line that weaves the world back together again. Where might this golden thread be found now? In March, early in the novel coronavirus pandemic, a global prayer was held at a designated time on a Sunday morning for the earth and all its inhabitants. My friend Jonah Gellerman called me and said, do you want to pray? And we prayed together. Like so many collective rituals, this reached me on the wind. Word of mouth, Jonah Gellerman. I walked outside and faced Drown Mountain, an ancient volcano plug in the southern end of the valley where I live. I've not shared this before. I held my grandmother's hand stone. It's an egg-shaped polished amethyst in my right hand as I had seen her do rep repeatedly. She gave this to me before she died. She told me it calmed her heart and also opened it. I closed my eyes in prayer believing in the power and connectivity of people gathered together in the name of health and peace on the planet. My mind was quiet and receptive. In time, I began to feel a heat rising in me from the ground up. To quell my fears and skepticism, I kept my attention focused on how the warmth was settling in my body. In my mind's eye, I saw a flame coming toward me from the center of Round Mountain, gaining in heat and size and intensity until it entered my heart, becoming, quote, a burning core of care, unquote. Those were the words that came to me as this force burned with a ferocity of intent that I have never known. My grandmother's hand stone was hot, almost too hot to hold. Opening my eyes, I opened my hand. The stone was shattered inside, with dozens of fracture lines appearing that had not been there before. I know because I checked at the clarity of the stone. It didn't make sense. My eyes focused on a particularly large and complex fracture that occurred at the intersection where the deepest purple merged with the brightest, clearest part of the crystal. Within that broken angle, it appeared brown, burnt. I lifted the crystal up toward the light, and therein I saw a flame. I have no explanation for this other than to say that what was burning in me burned through the gemstone in my hand, shattering it. The energy I felt rising from the earth through the soles of my feet and from Round Mountain itself directly entered my heart with the radiance of a million prayers circulating the planet and in that moment created a fire in me of inexhaustible light. This is my burning testimony. Call me a crystal gazer, call me a new ager. I cannot deny what I saw with my grandmother's hand stone. In my, un in my desire to understand my own unraveling in this global pandemic, I could not have imagined that it would be my grandmother's golden thread that would lead me to the source of my undoing and becoming, isolation and engagement. The golden thread became the gilded sunlight woven into the wings of the great blue heron fishing along the banks of the Colorado River. This same shimmering thread exposed the facts that deciphered the toxic residues from abandoned mines and uranium tailings which are poisoning our rivers, poisoning us, and killing the creatures. And still, the heron walks. In a similar way, it cinched the illegal wildlife trade that taunted wet markets with bush wheat. Our virus, a spillover, infecting us all, threatening what we have taken for granted, life, and still it walks. This golden strand reveals what binds awe and terror together as it travels through shadow and light, illuminating the loose threads wanting to be picked up by each of us so we can mend, repair, and restore what has come apart. 
We are earth unraveling and reforming creation. We are meant to engage, not isolate. These are difficult days. What causes us to recoil, strike, and retreat is also what allows us to reach out from the anxiety of unknowing and dare to trust what is to come, a reassembling of our humanity. There is something deeper than hope. Between the hours of darkness and dawn, the voices of our ancestors are amplified in the dream time, warning us of our awakening wisdom. It is not comfortable, a blessing to behold and a burden to enact. When I spoke to Jonah, a friend and medicine person who lives in Monument Valley, in the shadow of Bear's Ears, and asked him what he found, he said, we have to go deeper. July 27th, and this is the last one I will read, Believe. Summer 2021. If I were to scream fire, fire, in the middle of Harvard Square, would I be arrested on the grounds of creating panic in a public space through a false statement? If I yelled fire anywhere in the American West today, I would be met in a flash with shovels carried by volunteers with water hoses planted in shallow creeks ready to subdue the flames. Our desert hamlet of Castle Valley, located between red rock mesas and sandstone towers in southeastern Utah, can be described as living inside a blast furnace. Temperatures have topped 100 degrees most of the summer, peaking at 114 degrees Fahrenheit. Our volunteer fire department was called to three fires this past week, one ignited by sparks from an ax, another by an overheated Jeep engine, and a third fire caused by a man grinding metal that lit up grasses on his farm. And last month, close to 10,000 acres burned 20 miles south of us in the LaSalle National Forest due to a campfire left unattended, ignited by winds. For weeks, we watched pyrocumulus clouds rise above 12,000 foot peaks like atomic explosions. At night, flames crested haystack mountains, creating a red-orange horizon in darkness. It became a Rothko painting as my vision blurred with smoke. Our world is burning. Our world is in drought. Our world is being carried away by flash floods with rivers running black from cinders and ash. And the Colorado River is running a deeper red from eroding sandstone walls, if it is running at all. I'm going to cut this short, but just simply to say that last year, on July 27th, it was the historic low of Great Salt Lake. And Brooke and I went out to bear witness. What we saw was a horizon of salt. Antelope Island is no island at all. Great Salt Lake is disappearing. And in its disappearance, with 800 square miles now exposed, is the residue of cadmium, arsenic, and other heavy metals. And the dust devils that are growing and whipping, being blown across the Wasatch Front in Salt Lake City, are now putting the human and more than human world at risk. When Brooke and I saw this, we went north up to Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge to see what was happening there. Those 70,000 acres of wetlands that sparkle and sing were sun-baked playa. No bird song. Silence. We kept driving, not willing to accept what was before our eyes, until we finally found some fingerling rivulets of Great Salt Lake. There, we saw a line of white pelicans, and along the edges of the water, one great blue heron, one black-crowned night heron, a bevy of Franklin and California gulls, and one double-crested cormorant, black, with its arms outstretched on a weathered pole against a sea of salt. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Shock makes tears impossible. Where are the birds? Where am I? Where are we in this moment of drought and despair? Our natural touchstones of joy will deliver us to heartbreak and deliver us back to joy. Each of us will be forced to face the loss of the place that brought us to life, but we will remember that life because we carry it. We can stand with grief as our companions 
when the roar of Victoria Falls stops, or the tree that we thought would outlive us dies, or the spring lacks of strutting grass become silent. The place of our innocence is gone, even if Great Salt Lake floods in the future. We will remember how we felt in the exposure of drought. And I have to tell you a funny story. I got a call from a young person in her 20s, and she said, Ms. Williams, and I said, yes, and she said, we're having a rally on Great Salt Lake, and you're one of the few people living who remembers Great Salt Lake when it was full. <laughs> and she said, would you be willing to tell us what that was like? And I said, I would be honored. If the facts don't matter anymore, and misinformation does, if we fail to listen to the indigenous wisdom of First Nations and remain unmoved toward another way of being in right relationship to the earth, and the stories of statistics that scientists are bringing to us do not stir us to action on behalf of a living world that is suffering, and if the lives of our children and the future of our, their children's children are not first in our minds and thwarting the easy sleep of our privilege, then the question must be asked, are we too dead to the world to feel alive? The world is still so beautiful. Believe the long-legged birds who are circling above us, desperately looking for water. Believe the forests that are burning, whose surviving trees will later stand as sentinels, charred witnesses to animal bodies reduced to ash. Believe in flash floods roaring through burnt canyons, gathering debris and rivers running black in the desert, even in times of drought. Believe Great Salt Lake is retreating in plain sight, leaving what's left to the dust devils whipping up clouds of chemicals, resting on the dry lake bed as we inhale the toxic world we have created. Believe in the once shimmering bodies of water on the horizon that are now nothing more than a mirage made of heat waves dancing on the salt flats. Believe in the silences. Believe in beauty. Before we can save this world we are losing, we must first learn how to savor what remains. This is more than an ecological crisis or a political crisis. It is a spiritual one. The earth will survive us. There is something deeper than hope. We are the ones being baptized by fire. Fifteen more minutes. June 17th, 2022, last weekend. Our son, Louis Gakumba, and I made a pilgrimage to see Doug and Andrea Peacock. Lou, Louis had never met them. He knew of the depth of our friendship of 40 years, how Doug and I met on a trail in Glacier National Park. It was time. Louis had survived the Rwandan War, the genocide, and Doug had survived the Vietnam War. They had much to talk about. Louis had questions he wanted to ask Doug. The next day, we went to go see Doug and Andrea and their two colleagues, River and Hector, when we arrive, Doug greets Louis with open arms. Welcome, brother. The questions Louis had for Doug, he never asked. He became silent, overwhelmed, intimidated, in awe. He wanted to listen, he said to me. Maybe it was enough to simply be in one another's company. Maybe it was enough to sit down at their table and break bread together. Maybe it was enough to break open a bottle of bubbly beneath the beautiful cloud field Montana sky in Paradise Valley, even as it floods, and a toast to friendship. And when Doug and Andrea spoke about needing to prepare for the arrival of their family, Laurel, Stephen, and Olivia, three and a half years old, and how Doug said he needed to mow the grasses in their large backyard as a fire break, Louie finally spoke. Do you have a mower? And Doug yielded the mower to Louis for the next hour and a half until the backfield was mowed. Gestures are all. They transcend words. There is something deeper than hope. We need to have intergenerational conversations. The younger generation need to know what we have seen and learned. As we, the older generation, need to yield our power to the next generation and see not only what they want to do, but can do, as Doug said, in half the time with the strength and will that is theirs. We must listen to what they have to say, what they fear, and what they are determined to do. And they will be open to learn from us, even though 
We've made mistakes, especially through our mistakes. We need each other. As I look into this audience, a lot of us share the same color hair. And I challenge us to go home and to find the next member of our generational, intergenerational conversation and to mentor the next and the next and the next as they are mentoring us now. If we do not, that will be our greatest failure so that the next time we gather to talk about public lands and sacred ground, we will be the rarity. It will be filled with the young. We need each other. Doug's sage advice, arm yourself with friendship. I believe him. Rick believes him. I think we all believe him. And so did Louis. On our way home, I said, you know, everything good in my life has risen from that simple and profound fact. Friendship. Tell me a story. I will gather feathers. The next day, Andrea and Doug passed on a friend's name and contact information to Louis, who also lived in Richmond, active in the NAACP, and said he could teach him how to fly fish. To be here today in friendship with Doug and Andrea, Laurel and Stephen, and having met Olivia for the first time yesterday, another force of nature, of nature, no separation, is such a gift. I told Olivia that I would send her something from the desert. What? she asked. <laughs> and I gave her a list to choose from off the top of my head. Uh, a rock with a moon inside, a rock with constellations, a rock with a white band around it where you can make a wish, some seeds, a feather, you choose. She thought for a long time, and then she said, seeds. Seeds is our work now, to plant seeds as a gesture and an action. There is something deeper than hope, and that is our engagement with the land, with each other, with the rich diversity of stories planted in sacred ground. We are in a transitional moment, and it is part of the attentiveness and healing that is necessary. It is not easy. We cannot do it alone. We need each other. We need this. For those of us largely white who have been advocates for public lands, we are evolving and eroding at once, and this is a good thing. What we knew as BLM is now more readily understood in this country as Black Lives Matter. Say public lands, and they are acknowledged as stolen lands. Our conservation icons from Thoreau to Muir to Abbey are now discussed as men who took their laundry home to their mothers, as racists and misogynists. And wilderness with a capital W is too often seen as nostalgic at best and acts of colonialism at worst. We are also seeing public lands as part of sacred land protection working in cooperation with the tribes. Bears Ears National Monument is a powerful example. And what I can tell you after working for the last 10 years with the women of Bears Ears, their mantra, their task, their gift is, quote, the rematriation of the earth. Think about that and what that looks like. How do we be good allies? As environmentalists in the state of Utah, we are no longer leading. We are learning how to be good allies and have been changed by the indigenous leadership of the Ute, Mountain Ute, Diné, and Puebloan tribes and their generosity. The Rose Project was never about rugged individualism. He was a man in service of community who wanted to write. His cabin at Walden Pond was his writing studio. Mir was a man of his era and also a visionary. Abby continues to remind us, quote, we will outlive the bastards, unquote, if we remain, quote, part-time activists and part-time lovers, unquote, who continue to love the wild. Wilderness now is a stay against climate collapse, as Rick will show us with the Black Ram proposal as a climate refuge in the Yak. We are eroding and evolving together. It is time for us to listen. And as Tim Egan admonished us to be humble, teachable, of earth, for earth.
We, the people, have made mistakes. We've made mistakes with our relationships with those who came before us in the land that holds their histories. We have made mistakes in how we have misunderstood and managed the wild. But after spending a lifetime immersed in the American West and public lands, I believe we are slowly learning what it means to offer our reverence and respect to the closest thing we have to sacred lands, breathing spaces in the name of community, both human and wild. We are at a crossroads. We can continue on the path we've been on in this nation that privileges profit over people and land, or we can unite as citizens with a common cause and a diversity of stories. The health and wealth of the earth that sustains us. If we cannot commit to this kind of fundamental shift in our relationship to people and place, acknowledging Native people's leadership on how to steward these lands and the reparations required, then democracy becomes another myth perpetuated by those in power who care only about themselves. We are talking about the open space of democracy. June 24, 2022, Roe versus Wade overturned. This is a pause that is galvanizing our true power. We will fight with love, and that is not a paradox. That is the truth. More love, more joy, more ferocity, more resolve. Because what every woman knows is that our bodies and the body of Earth are one. We need only to look to her geologic, volcanic, climatic, flooding, burning, blowing, tsunami-esque and at times glorious wrath that forces us to rebuild our world in the humble stillness of the shock and awe of the aftermath that brings forth beauty and spiritual emancipation to us as sisters and to those we love. Whether it is the issues of who controls the land or issues of who controls a woman's body, issues of tribal sovereignty or issues of racial justice and injustice, issues of gun safety legislation and ongoing school shootings, to the violence that was both planned and perpetuated around the stolen election, quote unquote, on January 6, 2021, to issues surrounding migration and climate collapse. All these issues are interconnected and interrelated. What binds us together is a mutual regard and disregard for one another in the name of respect and reciprocity. Humility over hubris, power shared over power hoarded, and honoring the dignity and sovereignty of soul each human being must be afforded in order to be able to live and flourish in communities of care. Insects on a bough, floating down river, still singing. Isa. The eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. And it will come. To protect what is wild is to protect what is gentle, is to protect the stories that want desperately to come forth. New stories, diverse stories, stories that save our lives. Wild mercy is in our hands. Blessings. I have a tendency to following a solemn, serious moment of a little darkness, a little sadness, to crack a joke. I'm not going to do it. Uh, 
That was pretty moving. Uh, sometimes that kind of stuff needs to sit on you and soak in a little bit. Uh, and I don't want to disrupt that. Uh, <clears throat> pretty cool stuff. Uh, Doug Peacock? He'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> I will do. <laughs> Doug will be here momentarily. Uh, Doug is going to be talking about thank you, the healing power of the wilderness. Uh, and that's an interesting subject. <clears throat> Doug Peacock is best known for his book, Grizzly Ears, In Search of the American Wilderness. It's a memoir of his experiences in the 1970s and 1980s, much of which was spent in the wilderness of the western United States alone uh, observing grizzly bears. Uh, a close friend of Edward Abbey, uh, his real-life famous author. His real-life persona was enshrined in Edward Abbey's classic, uh, The Monkey Wrench Gang. Have anybody read that? Uh, the un <laughs> the, well, the unforgettable character of George Hayduke is him in real life. They spent years running around the uh, desert southwest doing strange things, planning on blowing up dams, <laughs> crazy stuff. Uh, Doug is a very colorful fellow with a wonderful story. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, he's going to give his talk and following that Terry Tempest Williams is going to come back up and she and Doug are sit up here and take your questions. Uh, they're longtime friends and it should be an interesting interactivity. Uh, while we wait for Doug, uh, to get back. I'm going to switch the schedule around a little bit. We're going to have a 15-minute break after that. Why don't we take that right now? Before we get going, I want to do one thing, and I want to acknowledge uh, the, for lack of a better term, the parent company uh, of this festival. Uh, the festival was put on by a, a group called Alpine Artisans. Uh, Their goal is to promote, promote and preserve the arts in the Sealy, Swan, Blackfoot Valleys, uh, which is the whole watershed moving from Missoula to the northeast, uh, and the home of Norma McLean and the original story, A River Runs Through It. Uh, <clears throat> they accomplish that through supporting the arts, art education, outreach, information gathering and sharing, and with an emphasis on getting it started with the children in the valley. Uh, it's been going for years. Uh, this is the biggest of, of their projects, but certainly not their only projects. They do quite a bit. Uh, so if you got the inclination to uh, support the arts in rural Montana, that big jar on the table up front uh, is big enough to drop a dollar in if you'd like, or, or one of the envelopes around here. Uh, and uh, we would appreciate it. And so would the people that run Alpine Artisans. With that, we can pick up where we left off. Uh, <clears throat> Doug Peacock, best known for his book, The Grizzly Years, In Search of the American Wilderness. Uh, basically a memoir of his wandering around through the Rocky Mountains for a couple of decades, uh, living in the wilderness, uh, watching the behavior of grizzly bears. Uh, like I mentioned before, he's a close friend of uh, the late Edward Abbey, and he is George Hayduke in the book, uh, The Monkey Wrench Gang. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to bring out Doug Peacock. Thank you. Uh, I've had the experience of uh, following Terry Timbus Williams uh, before. Uh, on the day that Rick Bass entered our lives, um, 
Terry and I had to do a public gig that someone had organized for NBC or CBS or one of those things uh, up in uh, Arches. And I, I was going up the night before uh, and my car broke down and I ended up sleeping in a ditch next to the highway, probably with a head full of tequila. And when I finally crawled up and hitched back up and uh, you know, went to the site where this memorial was being held on the Slick Rock. It's a place I've camped a lot, so it's a lovely place. But, you know, Terry dazzled them with her eloquence, as she always does. And you just never try to follow that up. You know, you're better off baffling him with bullshit. <laughs> and uh, so I think I'll be a little short tonight because we're running behind. And, uh, you know, we're going to get to, Terry and I will get together for some questions, and Rob has a panel, and uh, we're all going to participate on that anyway. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the, I showed up Friday, the assigned title to me was The Healing Power of Wilderness. And I think that's fair because uh, I use wilderness. I, it's in the subtitle of several of my books. And I, you know, I, so I think it's fair to, to saddle me with that. But you know, for a couple of days here, I've heard all kinds of arguments. First of all, you shouldn't be using a word wilderness because it doesn't apply anymore. And if you use it, no, nobody seems to know, you know, wants to at least state what the hell it means. And uh, so I thought I'd talk around it. I think personally, if you go into a thing that you m might suspect could be wilderness, looking for something, for yourself, you might be disappointed, and that's including healing. It is, uh, you know, but what a powerful accident can be. Um, so uh, I remember, you know, in, in particular, uh, I, I did, I followed grizzlies for about 20 years in Glacier and Yellowstone, and I spent almost a decade in Glacier bushwhacking every trailless drainage I could find and access to look for grizzly bears. And I remember that uh, decade of going to incredible places, not easy places, because they don't have trails and glacier can be a thick place, especially on the west side. But, uh, you know, the magic was there. And above all, it's a landscape where natural ecosystems, in some way, if they don't dominate the land, you just sit back for a few days and watch, and they will kind of emerge from the landscape on their own. Uh, the kind of uh, thing I needed when I came back and uh, ran into first I ran into grizzlies in Yellowstone, and that was back you know a long time ago. I came back in Vietnam. I was a Green Beret medic, uh, and I, I read in my own book that uh, who had seen a little too much collateral damage, which I defined as that cowardly phrase they used to describe the pile of small, dismembered bodies after a botched air attack. And I had spent the Tet Offensive as a medic. You do a lot of triage, and uh, that's uh, what sent me into the wilderness. I've been, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to return to the word because I find it very useful to speak of the landscapes of the heart and uh, myself and many of the people who are still my close friends. That term is totally relevant to what we fight for. That was the glue between Ed Evie's 20-year friendship and mine, you know, as we both recognized the power of the wilderness and the need to defend it. That was a, that was a real glue. Um, but when I came back, uh, I, I'm fairly comfortable in the wilderness, but like a, you know, a lot of other Vietnam vets in those days, you know, I, I was out of sorts, couldn't be around people. And so I went to the one place I was comfortable, and that is, you know, the so-called wilderness areas of uh, especially the Rocky Mountain Belt. And I uh, started out down south because it was spring and worked my way up the Rocky Mountains and by summer ended up in the Wind River Range on the east side on the, uh, you know, the Wind River uh, Indian Reservation, and uh, it's a very, uh, it's, it's the coldest, most glaciated landscape in the lower 48. Mount Baker used to have the biggest glaciers, but they melted a year or two ago. And what's left are the Wind Rivers, you know, south of Canada, Alaska. 
And so the weather's lousy in there. And I remember I was in the, the winds, and I'd spent 20 days by myself living off golden trout. I got so sick of golden trout. And, <laughs> and, and not only the diet, but I came down with a malaria attack. And, uh, you know, I'd had a bunch in Vietnam and had a couple after coming back. So I knew what was going to happen, you know, because you eventually run a very high fever and, and you go out of your mind. And so I said, you better get the hell out of the winds. They're much too rugged. The weather's lousy. And I was going to go into a place where the weather was balmy and the topography was almost flat. That's Yellowstone National Park for me, you know. I mean, compared to the winds, it was just... And there was a hot spring back in the area, and I decided I'd go back in this hot spring and soak in the hot waters, you know, the spa-like notion of regaining your health in the healing waters. And, you know, it took me, I'll never know how long I was in there, but uh, my, I kept my temperature a little log in my notebook. The last entry is 105.6. So I was, you know, hallucinating, you know, in a, the malaria paroxysm. And there were grizzly signs all over the place, but I didn't know if they're real or not. I thought I might be dreaming them. And so when I finally came out of, you know, my sleeping bag was soaking wet. I could have been there three days or three hours. I honestly never knew. But I, you know, had to go, of course, soak in a little hot creek and, uh, and you know, make a shaggy bear story a little shorter. You know, I was soaking in this hot spring with the water coming over my neck, and I looked across the meadow, and a couple, 250 feet away, here comes a mother grizzly with two yearling cubs. And I know hardly, I'd spent a summer in Alaska, but, you know, grizzly bears had never, I didn't get them in short, and uh, I didn't know much about Mother Grizzly except I'm supposed to stay the hell away from them. And so I decided that I was going to climb a little tree on the bank of this little tiny hot creek, and, and I stood up real fast, blacked out, you know, from the whirlpool-like effect of the hot water, smashed my head into a little lodgepole pine tree, blood streaming down my face, but I was terrified. So, uh, um, so I scrambled up this tree. When I got to the top, and I looked around, I discovered the tree wasn't much bigger than a Christmas tree. It, it, you know. And, you know, there I am, perched up there, and it's cold, it's October, by then the wind is blowing, and I'm bleeding, and I'm naked, and I'm blue, and, you know, like a, some species of silly tohi, or whatever is appropriate up there. And, uh, you know, those bears, they got my attention. They came over, and they never looked at me. They knew I was there the whole damn time. They wouldn't even look up at me, and you know, they'd graze 25 feet away. So, so those bears really got my attention. And uh, you know, and it took me, I was, I was there for another month hanging around. It turns out they were closing the dumps about that time too, which I didn't know anything about to begin with. But indeed, you know, uh, the bulk of Yellowstone's grizzly bears fed at garbage, open pit garbage dumps for 80 years, and they were all used to garbage. And when they started to close these dumps, the bears indeed went into campgrounds and town sites, and they got shot. Uh, Frank Craighead, one of his estimates was like maybe as many as 270 grizzlies in a five-year period were removed from that ecosystem from, you know, being shot at dumps and campgrounds and other, you know, garbage encounters. And I was around all that time, and, uh, you know, I saw what was happening in the Grizz. And uh, I'm just going to read the, the preface to, you know, my, my first book, Grizzly Years, if I can find one. And uh, because, uh, you know, I hung around grizzlies, and I didn't, I didn't know much about them at first, but uh, I had enough encounters that uh, I slowly learned that, you know, these, there were a bunch of bears around, and it's because they're, they were still feeding at a dump that wasn't too, too many miles away. And, it, you know, the, the whole, like a salmon stream or anything else, but bears do form social hierarchies, most dramatically seen at salmon streams, but they happen in other habitats, too, even in berry patches. And there was one big boar that dominated this hierarchy of grizzly bears. So I'll just read this paragraph here. Uh, the big bear stopped 30 feet in me, 30 feet in front of me. I slowly worked my hand to the bag. I still carried a magnum pistol in those days because my education 
about grizzly bears is like Argosy and True Magazine, you know, I say, well, you got to carry a really big pace, you know. So, you know, I was, I peered down the gun barrel into the dull red eyes of the huge grizzly. He gnashed his jaws and lowered his ears. The hair on his hump stood up. We stared at each other for what might have been seconds, but felt like hours. I knew once again that I was not going to pull the trigger. My shooting days were over. I lowered the pistol. The giant bear flicked his ears and looked off to the side. I took a step backward and turned my head towards the trees. I felt something pass between us. The grizzly slowly turned away from me with grace and dignity and swung to the timber at the end, end of the meadow. I caught myself breathing heavily again, the flush of blood hot on my face. I felt my life had been touched by enormous power and mystery. I didn't know that the force of that encounter would shape my life for decades to come. Tracking grizz would become full-time work for six months of many years, and it lingers yet at the heart of any annual story I tell of my life. I have never questioned this route, the route this journey took. It seems a single trip, the sole option, driven by that same potency that drew me into grizzly country in the beginning. And that was a long time ago, over 50 years ago, that, that journey started and it's still going on today. Uh, one of my most recent encounters was, a, a, you know, dramatic encounter with the grizzly um, was oh, four, four or five years ago uh, with my daughter Laurel. And we were in Yellowstone, we climbed a high butte, and it was probably the last, you know, it, it was, it was going to be the last time we took a hike before I walked her down the aisle uh, later that year. And uh, that whole family's here now tonight. So, you know, what a time it was. So Laura and I, you know, climb up on this butte and the wind is raging in Yellowstone. You know, I can just go, and there's a bunch of glacial erratics, big, big boulders up in the top of this hill. And we're huddled behind a great big metamorphic glacial erratic. Did I say erratic? <laughs> Sometimes it's the same thing. <laughs> Erratic erotics. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden I'm trying to shelter my daughter from the wind, the howling wind, and I see her eyes go, you know, she's looking off to the side and right over a little rise, 50, 75 feet from us, really, really close, is a mother grizzly with her yearling cub. And we all see each other at the same time. You know, in the grizzlies rear, that's what they do to hear and see better. Once a grizzly rears, it's no longer a threat. Never believe that kind of bullshit about, you know, a standing grizz being a threat because that means you're considering getting out of there. And, and I think I, I whispered to Laurel, don't move, <laughs> which is uh, the only reasonable thing you can do in that situation. <laughs> And so we sat there, and, and you know, and the bears, mother bears, especially when they're deciding, you know, trying to evaluate the threat. Basically, as long as you are not a threat to their young, you'll get out of it every time. And I've been charged three dozen or more times, you know, especially when I was starting out and kind of young, younger and stupider. And, um, you know, they all stopped. One grizzly mother skidded to a stop, just... I don't know, six feet away, really close. And she leaned forward as if to sniff my pant leg and then turned around and hightailed it. So, you know, you just don't know till the last minute. But anyway, this bear is standing up and she slobbers and she looks around and uh, she rears and what. And after a few minutes, they settle down and come right over this hill towards Laurel and me, still cowering next to this big rock. Um, and they come right by us, you know, they come by us to closest, closest to me and Terry, that's what, 20, 25 feet, really close. And they go to the edge of this cliff. And then it's June during the mating season for grizzlies. And, um, you know, I had heard the bellows of a distant mating couple. I mean, it, it, you're lucky to hear that ever, but, you know, that's a time of year you will hear it. So there is a boar grizzly, you know, a amorous boar grizzly in the area. And mother grizzlies, uh, that time of year, take, often take their, their cubs up to cliff faces and just hang out on the cliffs, you know, 
Uh, the Meary brothers documented this at the, you know, the Grizzlies of Mount McKinley back a long time ago. But that's what happens. And so this mother grizzly went to the edge of the cliff, which is only 15 feet away from me and my daughter, and plopped over on her back and nursed her cub for, we don't, I, I don't know, I, I keep saying six or seven minutes, but it could have been five, too. But, uh, you know, she's right there, and you can hear it, the rhythmic sound of, of, of nursing is like a putter, you know, it oscillates. And, you know, that is magic. And, and that, you know, that has to be generated by mutual trust in wild beings. You need to know enough about grizzlies to be able to share that space because they certainly will share it with you. And so that's, you know, the evolution of a, well, hell, that's what, 40 or more years between, you know, the first grizzly and uh, the encounter with the mother. And it was such a memorable occasion, of course, because my daughter and uh, me up on a rock. So that was great. Um, I'm going to see here because I'm going to try to. You know, the, 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 the landscapes that uh, I encounter, um, you know, I'm looking for. Uh, it, the main thing you keep you keep your senses open and available, and uh, you know, uh, the, I used to use wilderness in in, in this sense. I said the, the easiest exit, quickest exit I know from culture, is wilderness because you get so far out of yourself. You are so unimportant in that landscape that you're able to look back in. And I think you know most of us could use use a glance at our own culture. There's a lot of work to be done there. And, uh, you know, I've used that all my life. And I have a, you know, I have a penchant for, well, they're, 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 they're called man-eaters, but that's a misnomer because they're quite equal opportunity, you know. But, you know, I like, I like the grizzlies and jaguars and tigers, lions, you know. It, it, it adds a little zest to your little wilderness experience. And it also really it, you know, allows you to examine your own life, your own wounds if you need to, and, and try, try to see what's there, see what's there beyond culture. And, uh, you know, the, the, the easiest attitude is basically one of humility. And, you know, the, the grizzly bears are kind of an enforced humility themselves, and they really allow you you know, to get out of yourself. You don't walk down the trail thinking about your portfolio or your girlfriend, you know. You, you know you're looking better, smelling better. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a great aid to me. Um, also, I know what I was going to do. Can somebody give me a time check? Because I know we're running behind. When did I start blabbing? 15, 10 minutes ago? What do you think? Never mind. Okay, shut up, Doug, and keep babbling. I got it. I, <laughs> loud and clear. Um, so I went down to Mexico uh, back in the mid-'80s to look for the last Mexican grizzly. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, down in, uh, down in uh, eastern Chihuahua, you know, there's an island, a couple of island mountain ranges north of Chihuahua City, and the, the biggest one had grizzlies all the through, all through the 70s, and then the rumors just disappeared. You know, there was a grizzly somebody shot in that mountain range and tied to the top of a pickup truck and drove around Chihuahua City in 1966. But so I went down there with a with a pal, and it took us. Almost a week to get into the country because we had to run down the landowner, and uh, you know because those big private ranches are often owned you know by a single landowner, and this guy uh, who owned this mountain range, his name was Leggett, and his father owned almost all of Chihuahua until you know the revolution in 1910, when uh, everybody Pancho Villa and the others. Uh, 
uh, took all his land and, and gave it to the peasants. And uh, who, and this is the, the this is the, the word we got off the ranch manager that, you know, and the peasants ate all these cows. But, you know, a, after that he, you know, the, the, the family had enough money to buy the land back, but they were still sore, you know, they're sore about the cow barbecues, you know, like, uh, uh, it's just 70 years later, so. You know, we, we didn't bring it up much. But that's, you know, a rancher who can afford to lose a cow or two is going to have a, a mountain range. And down there, you know, in, in, in the mid-'80s, it met, you know, the last of the megafauna of the Sierra Madres. And that's, that's wolves, that's grizzlies, that's jaguars. And there's some others, too, you know, that you get both lions and jaguars, ocelots and bobcats in that same habitat. It's really rich as hell, and it's different from any flora or fauna that I know between the tropics and uh, Arizona. It's a great place. So anyway, we go in there, and we're going to go in, and uh, I'm going to find the best grizzly habitat and look for grizzly sign. Well, if it's like going into the bitter root, which I've done too, looking for grizzly sign. And after you know, a period of absence, the one thing of grizzly sign that might remain and does remain for years are digs, especially in alpine areas, you know, and black bears might dig up an anthill, but they don't, they don't dig, you know, like a grizzly does, like a giant badger. They, they dig all kinds of pits and holes and trenches, and that's, uh, that's, that's what I was looking for down in the Chihuahua. Well, about a week into this country, uh, we're going along, and all of a sudden, there's a track of a huge cat. Now, I've had a lot of experience with mountain lions in their track, but this was the biggest track I'd ever seen. It was like maybe a 200-pound mountain lion. I'd never seen a mountain lion that big. But uh, this, so there's an alarming cat track, and it wasn't quite right. And me and my, uh, my, uh, my veteran buddy, uh, we, were just, we knew that there had been jaguar in that country, but we weren't astute enough to tell from the track it was a, a big mountain lion or a jaguar. But in fact, after about four days of us tracking this cat, um, it, was, it, it was obvious to us by then that it was not a mountain lion. It was some animal we hadn't seen before. And, uh, and, uh, I'm just going to read a short section if I can find it here. Cat track. Yeah, it's a mountain lion. Anyway, uh, it, it, after, after a while it's edgy because everywhere we go we see this, this huge cat track. And finally we settle into a camp next to the habitat where I'm going to go look for grizz sign the next day. And, you know, we make these very, quite comfortable ca camps because uh, you know, the bottom lands of the riparian areas are all live oaks, great firewood. There's a little trickle of water because it's a well-watered mountain range. And so, you know, there's nobody there. There hasn't been anybody there for decades. And uh, so we make it, we settle into a camp. I am snug in my sleeping bag, about to fade off when the nearby yips of coyotes snaps me awake. A few minutes later, a deeper, lower howl rumbles through the canyon. Did you hear that? Scarp Wester. Scarp is my, uh, my pal. This Sierra is silent. Neither of us speaks. After a five minute pause, we hear an answering howl from the opposite directions. Wolves, I thought they'd be here. What riches. We are sharing the mountain range with a jaguar and at least two Mexican wolves. If only a grizzly bear would wander into the fading firelight, we'd have it all. A gold mine of apex predators, all the top predators of the Sierra Madre. And so the next day we go up and, and I find digs, you know, 119 digs on this mountaintop. And it's grizzlies from, you know, the fall before and the year before that. And, you know, that's a giant revelation. When I decided to publish uh, uh, my my stories that had been unpublished in book form, I picked the ones where there was some kind of thing I needed to register, like the studying of that Mexican grizzly. I never registered that, and so that's why I picked it up. 
So anyway, me and Scarp find Grizzly sign. We come down the mountain, and you know we're we're uh, you know we're celebrating. And uh, we lean on our bedrolls by the glowing fire, listening to the night sounds of owls and goat suckers. A coyote yaps from somewhere down the canyon. Then a coughing sound close to camp breaks the silence. The low vocalization is strange to my ears. It puzzles and alarms us, and for a very real minute, scares the shit out of me. It seems to be coming from a big cat, and that cat is very close. Holy shit, murmurs Scarp, you know, in his wisdom. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. We get up, I throw logs on the fire. The coughing is coming from just beyond the firelight. We are too alarmed and cautious to investigate. You know, go out there in the dark and look for that kitty, no way. <laughs> so we cling to the blaze. I can hear brush moving. It's a jaguar from certain. Ha. Huh. Anyway, there's one last cough in the darkness, only a stone's throw from a fire, then silent. I go out the next morning and you can smell it. You know, the jaguar's got a really distinct odor, it turns out. And that coughing sound uh, is Pathoigmonic, even though I'd never heard it before. So, you know, the the animal universe is really uh, colors the landscape, and the landscape that I love, where wilderness, you know, seems an appropriate description because, you know, it is far from any visual remnants of any kind of human activity except for, you know, rare archaeological things. Um, and, uh, you know, our relationship with, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up real quick here, but, you know, our relationship with wild animals on this continent, you know, if there's indeed a trinity of original sin for Europe, Americans beyond genocide and slavery. I believe it's the way we've treated uh, the charismatic wildlife of the West. And nothing shows that better than our treatment of the bison. Back, uh, back in the, still the early years, the 70s, I, I, I used to chase after grizzly bears, and I'd carry a really heavy pack because I had a 16 millimeter movie camera. And I was by myself up uh, Astringent Creek, which is Pelican Valley, and Astringent Creek was the site of the last bison. You know, all the bison in the world that they couldn't catch were in Pelican Valley at, in 1902, and they could only catch 23 wild animals. That's as many as they couldn't catch. And, that's as many as were left out of 60 million bison. And uh, so I'm there, you know, stalking grizzlies, and I run across a grizzly family early in the year, and I'm still on snowshoes, and because uh, there's a lot of snow in the meadows, less so under the trees, and uh, I'm coming back down towards my camp, and I see this grizzly family in the same place that I'd filmed them early in the day, so I wanted to avoid the grizzly family and leave them in peace. But I had to cut through kind of a thumb of timber in this uh, defile, which it would, would be the meadows of Stringent Creek. Subsequently, that uh, area has uh, gone through forest fire. But anyway, I started to cut through this uh, timber patch. And there's a little bit of snow on the ground, but not entirely. And I came across the patch of axe-hewn logs. I mean, right in the middle of no place. And the evidence was really clear. There was a hanging log left. There was, you know, the remains of some crude camp equipment there. And there were some broken, you know, some old cans, garbage, broken bottles on the ground. And uh, one of these, uh, you know, there were a lot of bottles, uh, tops, and I had researched the crown top, which was invented in 1892, and there were a bunch of these things around. So this was a poaching camp, and probably dated from, uh, you know, from the 1890s. And it was unmistakably the camp of the most famous poacher in Yellowstone history. Uh, Howell was his name, and he was poaching bison in Pelican Valley. 
Uh, I got all my details out of that great book, Grinnell, from, from my neighbor, John. But it, you know, registering that, uh, that uh, camp was really important. And I've left a topographical map with a pinprick in it with my daughter, in case I croak before I get to tell anybody where it is. But anyway, <laughs> she's still got it. And, and I, I, right in the middle of that chapter, I stopped and I, and I wrote something. And here's, here's what I wrote. It's about bison. I need to say something about bison. I consider the bison a miracle's quintessimal animal, as important to our hearts and souls as grizzlies or any other creature. My own partisan views are carved from decades of watching bison. All the time I lived in the back of the Yellowstone filming grizzly bears, bison were my daily companions. Back in the 70s, grizzlies were less common. Sometimes you didn't see a bear for a week or so. But the bison were there every day, prancing, rolling, bellowing, dominating the landscape. Watching them became an ecology of thinking. And these bison were the great, great grandchildren, many times, you know, great grandchildren, of those 23 wild animals they couldn't catch in Yellowstone's Pelican Valley in 1902. Their kinship gave me immense pleasure, and we almost slaughtered them into extinction right there in a stringent creek. These great herds of totemic animals had thundered through human consciousness since the beginning of our kind. Today, I have been fortunate to have witnessed the tip of that ancient iceberg of animal craving, when I saw wildebeest in the Kalahari and the caribou up on the Porcupine River of Alaska. But the most astounding herd to roam the face of the earth was the American bison of the Great Plains. The numbers we hear stagger the imagination. 60 million bison at the time of Lewis and Clark, a single group of 10 million bison taking several days to cross a great river in Iowa. The reasons given for their demise are the usual ones, manifest destiny, European dominion, the need for agricultural lands, or a way to deal with the final solution to the Indian problem by eliminating their commissary, the bison. But there was something different about the way we went after the bison. Unlike, unlike wily wolves, fierce grizzlies, or indigenous people who fought back, the bison just stood there and took it. They were killed for their hides and tongues, for sport and for the hell of it. The army gave out, gave out free ammunition to any dude riding a railroad who could shoot them from the train, leaving millions of bison to rot and die. None of this adds up to the answer to the real question. Why did the bison hold a place of such reverence and respect for Native Americans for millennia while European immigrants gleefully annihilated them in half a century. The two cosmologies could not be more divergent. I've never been able to wrap my mind around this bedrock contradiction. Our American, our American history books don't discuss this dark quandary that seems to represent the beginning of our Western relationship with the continent's wildlife and the land itself. These are the beasts we never knew. I'm going to just skip and read the last paragraph of this here book. Uh, Okay, uh, this is the last book. I published this here. Bo both of them have wilderness in them as a subtitle, so, you know. <laughs> Hell, I can't help it. When it is indeed our time, I, I'm talking about climate change, especially in this uh, chapter. When it is indeed our time to walk off stage with the mammoths, what might be the measure of our character at the end of our tour? After peering into the abyss, how do we behave? There is great joy in doing the toil of the world, fighting for wild causes, saving pieces of the magnificent natural world. There's plenty of work. Do your job with decency and an open heart. Love your brothers and sisters in all actions, in all relationships. This is didactic, but it's only one paragraph out of 300 pages, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Speak the truth. <laughs> Extend your innate empathy to distant tribes and strange animals. Hold nothing back. Join the tribes in their dignified defense of native right. 
This is an important sentence. An indigenous viewpoint should replace all notions of Western wildlife management. Respect this militant resistance and embrace the necessity of civil disobedience. What's right isn't always legal and vice versa. Consider getting arrested. Who and what is at risk? If past extinctions provide guidelines, then it's all life larger than a small meadow mouse. Now I can unpleasantly anticipate being among those minority humans left on earth that die from old age. I'd be happier if everyone could. It's a scourge in my geezerhood. I am unconcerned with my own death and fiddling engaged in the lives of all my survivors. There is a bottomless contradictory sadness and a fleeting glimpse of justice. Nature bats last, avenging the scorched earth, payback to homo sapiens, bundled up in the loss of beauty and suffering in the lives of people you love most. Then I watched a grizzly bear slowly walk through a herd of elk in Glacier Park. The elk didn't get out of his way at all, and it didn't matter. And uh, I, I list a number of things like that. And at the end of the book, the last sentence reads, it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> What are you doing, buddy? Doug cannot leave. <laughs> Clean it up. Yep. And uh, TT, Tracy. Or, We're going to now have a, a Q&A with uh, uh, Terry Tempest Williams and Doug. So if you have your questions, which I'm sure some of you do, I'm going to be doing my best to spot your, your, right. your uh, raised arms. And if you're up in the, uh, in the balcony up here, I'll do my best to spot you. Uh, and if we call on you, Speak out really loudly because we won't have a mic up there. Uh, so, hey, here we go. We're high screens. Uh. Oh man, this is great. So, is your spot? Yeah, uh, this uh, this one okay. I believe is uh, is working. Terry and I are old friends. We have a few secrets, but probably not too many. So don't don't worry about it. We have a question right sure. here. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, right. What is it? Seven, 20 years? I mean, right. Oh. Uh huh. Well, in the new book, there's a, it's called the Cooking Sheep Herder Stew for Edward Abbey, and the first thing is. Uh, with a couple of pals, I had to go out and uh, poach an appropriate slow elk, which, uh, you know, in modern terms, it recognizes cattle rustling, published by, uh, you know, jail time hanging or something in between all throughout the West. So there are things like that, yes. We have a question down here in the front row. I didn't answer it directly. We'll bring you a mic Talk so is cheap, everybody can you know. hear it. Yeah, uh, in recent years, um, some conservation groups have been using collaboration to work out wilderness uh, controversies, wilderness positions, uh, which involves a significant amount of compromise with those who do not support wilderness. I'd like to get your viewpoint from both Terry and, and from Doug on your opinion of collaboration as a model for resolving wilderness uh, issues. You know, the, the one thing worth insisting and fighting upon is you know, wilderness is a fleeting uh, 
image of what we've got left, diluted in all respects. And, uh, you know, the official designation of, of wilderness is, is essential in saving all of these places. Without it, you have roads, you have ATVs, motorized traffic, and it can't protect a damn thing. And so it's worth everything not to compromise on that issue, you know. Um, and I'm not much of a collaborator, but, but, <laughs> but I am working, you know, in a, in a I am working, I've, I've been working on an underpass of I-90, an existing one, you know, with Lance Craighead, and th that's going along well. We're, uh, hired a, a law firm here to look into poaching and the incredible taking of moving grizzly bears. The grizzly bears are, especially in Yellowstone ecosystem, because of climate change, are wandering out of there. And we call them explorer bears. There's the bears that wander from the ecosystem, but they go all the way to, you know, for instance, north to I-90. The Yellowstone grizzly population segment will never be recovered until it hooks up with glacier, in short. And so you got you, you got to do that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, the Federal Wildlife Service, even though we've got a new president and secretary of interior, has not changed the bloody iota, I believe. You know, the same people are entrenched. And of those grizzlies that they find outside the ecosystem, you can't help but run into a, you know, a, a chicken coop or a cow or a garbage can if you're a bear coming through these valleys. I, you know, and I live in one of them, right? Grizzlies get as far north as, as where I live on the Yellowstone River. Uh, but they, they euthanize, they, you know, a nice term for you know, killing, in various ways of killing those wandering grizzlies, the ones they claim are wandering. I don't think a grizzly bear has ever imagined him or herself wandering. But, uh, you know, uh, they, they kill more than they uh, try to translocate. and just isn't done anymore. And they have criterion from the 1986 grizzly bear guidelines that are obsolete and ancient and so complex, they can justify killing any bear any time, and they do just using that amorphous thing. So I hired a law firm to get all the incident reports and look for contradictions in that use of those sloppy guidelines, hoping we can at least revisit it in a court of public opinion, if not a law court. I would say collaboration is the way forward. <laughs> and I love you. And we have different approaches sometimes. Uh, I know with Bears Ears National Monument, the strength of that was the collaborative spirit led by the tribes. Um, every environmental group that I knew in the state of Utah and nationally were supportive, as were uh, the outdoor recreation groups, um, religious groups, um, across the board. And I think that was, was much of its power. I know in the little desert hamlet we live in, desert of Castle Valley, um, there were talk, there was talk of great development, a golf course in fact, and there's no water in our valley, especially now in the drought. And again, it was a collaboration between the Bureau of Land Management, between the town of Castle Valley, again, the climbers who come to Castle Valley to climb, as well as the residents. And the residents could not be more diverse, including um, those who voted for Trump and those who didn't, um, polygamous, teachers, artists, uh, again, I think it was the collaboration that led the way forward and found a different alternative than uh, development, which was trading out some of the lands in Castle Valley um, elsewhere in the state where it was more conducive for what they were looking for. I find the, the climate different where there's large predators involved and uh, I'm talking about the Northern Rockies. We, have, uh, the, we could not have a more murderous political culture than, than Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. And their governors and legislatures right now. Uh, increasingly, I believe that modern people 
we know so little about the natural world, and I, I believe uh, we fear, you know, we, uh, we fear what we don't know, and we hate what we fear. And the hostile, murderous attitude towards grizzlies, bison, especially wolves, and even mountain lions. I mean, across and I would add prairie dogs. Sure. I know they're small. <laughs> but no. You know, did you see that one of the? I, I totally agree. Did you see one of the? Um, he was a congressman, who said the reason why MR15s were necessary was. <laughs> to shoot prairie dogs. That's right. And that's where, again, I think it's all interconnected, interrelated for exactly what you're saying. A murderous culture versus um, one that supports and honors a reverence for life. Reverence for all other species. And I believe the, the well we draw that kind of tolerance from, I mean, it. it, 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 it for me, it really starts with other animals, but it's extended universally to other languages, cultures, genders. Other questions? <coughs> yes. I think, yes. I'm just trying to remember a phrase accurately that Terry used. I think it was, it's not about anger, it's about healing. Is that your phrase? It's Willie Gray Eyes' phrase. It's what? Willie Gray Eyes, his okay. phrase. But that, but that was what you said. It's not about anger, it's about healing. Right. And we have a question on here in the front row. And also in the very back, our friend oh. from the Bob Marshall. We'll get there. Hello. Um, this is a question for Terry and also um, related to the need for healing right now. Um, I'm thinking about an essay that you wrote about the need to bridge the divide with one of your relatives who is on the complete other end of the political spectrum and how challenging it is to um, have those relationships. And uh, <laughs> I think you kind of came to the conclusion that you, you might try to depoliticize some of your language in order to maintain that relationship. And um, I struggle with that myself, especially as a writer and as someone who loves people who think wildly differently than I do. And I'm wondering if, um, even though that was only about a year ago, in a lot of ways it was kind of a lifetime ago, and if, um, if that's a subject that you've thought about um, and if you still feel the same or if, if you have any, or even maybe just today, because <laughs> um, I know that that can change on a day-to-day -day basis, just how we're feeling. Thank you for that question. Uh, you're referring to my uncle, Richard Tempest, whom I love. And he has, between us, um, hundreds and hundreds of guns, and he would tell you that. He's a gun collector, primarily rifles. Brown guns, as he says, opposed to black guns. And I knew during, after the election um, that there was a window that we could talk to each other. And that was before the uh, determination was made that Joe Biden won the presidency. And I called him to find out how he was and what he thought were close. And he wouldn't answer my calls. And he called my father and said, tell Terry to just back off. I don't want to talk to her. And my dad said, what's wrong with you? You know, how can you be afraid of her? And so he called me and he said, Terry, it's rich. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and I said, but I want to talk to you. And he said, I'm not going to change and neither are you. And I said, how do we know that? And he said, are you going to change your view on abortion? No. Are you going to change your view on gay marriage? No. Are you going to change your view on climate? No. And I said, <coughs> are you going to change your view on guns? And he said, of course not. And he said, Terry, I read your book, Erosion, and I was not moved. I was irritated. <laughs> and he said, I've known you since you were born, and you had a gift, and that gift was a love of nature. 
And he said, from the time you could walk, you were involved in hocus pocus, and we all worried about you. <laughs> and he said, but now you've gone too far. And he said, if you want to move me, and people like me, which is most of the people in the state and our family, I would exhort you to go back to beauty, which is where it began, and depoliticize your language. And I said, I will try. And I said, what will you do? And he said, I'll continue talking to you. I wrote that up as an op-ed piece, and I cannot tell you the hate mail that I got saying, why? Why go, why make any amends? Or what would be the word? Concessions to the other side. And I don't feel I have that option because he's my uncle and he's family. And I feel that if you can't have the conversation with your own family member, then we don't have a voice. So I'm open. Um, where do we stand now? I don't know. I know that I called my cousin on Friday, Lynn, who is a sister to me, and we both cried because another door has closed among our family members, both about guns and about women's rights. It's not easy, but like Doug says, it's worth it. We have a question. Hi. So, I think this might be a good follow-on to that. A hundred years ago, this year, Aldo Leopold first proposed the idea of wilderness for the Gila. And yesterday, Roz used the term, there is no such thing as wilderness. As somebody who is a practitioner of the, the law, the Wilderness Act, and almost the rock in which I am anchored to, how do I find the space in my world to make sure that I hear others who don't agree with that rock as an anchor, that see that rock as a misstep or a misunderstanding? I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about that uh, idea of the evolving thinking on the Wilderness Act itself and how do we those of us who love the ideal be open to those who have very different views on the concept. Um, Doug needs some clarification. <laughs> I'm a translator right now. I've lost the microphone, so I'll try to be loud. Is wilderness something we can compromise an inch or a mile? Or do we not compromise at all? I think we're so close to being on the edge to losing uh, big areas that are required to support animals like grizzly bears, because that's really kind of what I look at. And, uh, it, you know, I talk about wilderness, but to officially engage in the language, it has to do with Forest Service and, and uh, Wilderness uh, Act proposals. And I adhere to a, a, you know, strict, when dealing with legal issues, just uh, we need to legally define wilderness to, uh, to as opposed to losing it once and forever. Once you bring roads and vehicles in, it's just, it's gone, you know? And it's, it's, it's another, uh, you know, it's another landscape for sale. And I come from a long line of people who just have always challenged that notion, even though we've lost most of the way, you know? I, I'm not sure I believe in my own private property or anybody else's. I just, I just love the notion of sacred lands and open spaces. I think we have to be creative. I think what Deborah Magpie Erlene was saying yesterday, language matters. And I know in Utah, wilderness is, is the dividing line. 
Um, and so we have found other ways to go about it, you know, whether it's um, recreation areas, whether it's what we did in Castle Valley in terms of land trusts. And, you know, I think there are ways around it, but nothing protects like wilderness. And I do think we have to fight for that. And it's what Rick's going to talk about with rather than calling it wilderness, calling it a climate refuge. So I think we can be creative. Again, I think we need to be allies to Native people and to bring in a larger, more inclusive um, audience as well as constituency so that it's not just the same old people, but what we're doing is broadening the definition rather than narrowing it. Thank you for the work you do. We, uh, because of the scheduling, we only have time for one more question, uh, and we'll get this gentleman here who's been trying hard. Okay, and this is some ways a follow-up to the question that, that this j last gentleman asked, but um, I recently heard an interview with uh, J. Drew Lanham. I might be familiar with his work. He's a black ornithologist, activist, who's done some really good work, a lot of things I appreciate, but... In this interview, he suggested that wilderness, as we're thinking about it, as roadless areas, um, have tended to be the province of the elite and the privileged few. And that uh, from that aspect, we needed to re-examine the concept. And I know that sort of feeds into some of the things you've been talking about, but I wonder if you have a reaction to that. As w and I know that's been a criticism that's been uh, expressed from the, maybe the right. ARV people, et cetera. Thanks. Well, Drew's my friend. I think he's wrong. And, uh... and I think it's all part of the conversation. You know, I, I'm, I'm really tired of uh, dis discussing or landing on binaries of this or that. I think it's this, that, and all of it, and let's have a conversation and see where that's coming from. I think that's our only way. And I want to use um, the time we have left to just, you know, nothing matters except for your own hometown or your own home state or your own home region. And I want to acknowledge two people. One, Tracy Stone Manning, who we're going to hear from, and her leadership. I breathe easier at night knowing that you are in charge, Tracy. And the other thing is I want to share with all of you that Doug was honored in New York City by the Academy of Arts and Letters with a nonfiction literary award. And that comes from being non-compromising and eloquent. So, <laughs> love to you. Love you. Thank you, Terry. We'll get out of here. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you guys are great. I wish we had more time. So, brother, okay. Terry happened to mention uh, Tracy Stone Manning, which is good because I can see her over here. Uh, <clears throat> and let me give you a quick little rundown for the few of you that may not know who Tracy Stone Manning is. Uh, <clears throat> she's going to be talking about new priorities for public lands. She's a Missoula person, uh, married to Dick Manning, who's out here somewhere, himself a... Uh, a well-known author and a cool guy. Uh, she, she's from Missoula, but they, they both live in Washington, D.C. right now because she was recently approved by Congress uh, to lead the Bureau of Land Management. Yesterday, described as in old, the old days, Bureau of Livestock and Mining, uh, she's turning that around. Uh, she was brought in there by the Biden administration. Uh, she previously worked for Steve Bullock, uh, heading up uh, DEQ, the Department of Environmental Quality here in Montana. And prior to that, she was the uh, director of the Clark Fork Coalition, a major environmental 
group that's still very active here in Missoula. So with that as a background, I would like to introduce Tracy Stone Manning. Hi, everyone. I'm going to take a moment to get organized here and decide whether we're using the laptop or paper. We're using the laptop. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jenny and the entire conference crew, thank you so much for having me here today. It is so good to be home. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's also an honor to share the stage with so many remarkable writers, and I have to say also a little bit daunting. Um, I wish you had seen the face of one of my colleagues in the communications shop at the Bureau of Land Management when I said, I'll be speaking between Terry Tempest Williams, Doug Peacock, and Rick Bass. <laughs> so no pressure. <laughs> um, I am taking solace in the fact that I am among friends, I am here for my day job, and I am not the writer in my family. Um, speaker, speaking of writers and admiration, John McLean, thank you for sharing your father with us, and of course, thank you for your own talent. The one thing that all of us uh, in this room share beyond presumably the love of a perfectly crafted sentence is the topic of the conference, sacred lands, our public lands and waters. At the Bureau of Land Management, we're responsible for managing 245 million acres. That's one in 10 acres in this country. All of them owned by all of us. All of them important. Some of them downright sacred. It's a responsibility this, admi uh, this administration takes profoundly seriously. It's something I take profoundly seriously. I want to focus for a moment on our commitment to tribal nations the United States has made solemn promises to tribal nations for more than two centuries. Honoring those commitments is particularly vital now as we face crises related to health, the economy, racial justice, and climate change, all of which disproportionately harm Native American communities. At the BLM, honoring our nation-to-nation -nation relationship with tribal nations, strengthening tribal sovereignty and self-governance, and upholding our trust and treaty responsibilities are paramount to fulfilling our mission. We understand that we best serve when we speak with and listen to tribal voices when formulating policy that affects tribal nations. That's why I was so incredibly honored last weekend to stand with the leaders from five tribal nations to protect sacred ground on their ancestral homelands. On behalf of the BLM, I signed a cooperative agreement with the Hopi, Zuni, Ute, Ute Mountain Ute, and Navajo tribes that informs how we're going to create a co-management plan for the Bears Ears National Monument together. The, the agreement signing was unprecedented and profound and moving. After the signing, we gathered alongside the highway and unveiled one of the monument signs, the signs that the agency didn't get a chance to erect before President Trump had dismantled the monument on Secretary Zinke's recommendation. And fortunately, Secretary Holland and President Biden understood the error and fixed it, with the president issuing a new proclamation to reestablish the monument. The proclamation calls for the co-management of that monument. So before we dusted off and erected the signs, we realized we needed not only the logos of the BLM and the Forest Service, they also needed to include the insignias of the five tribes, because the lands in Bears Ears have been managed by those tribes for millennia. There was much joy as the canvas fell to reveal the signs, our commitment for all to see, some tears and hugs. These efforts underscore our belief that the federal government has much to learn from tribal nations and that strong communication is fundamental to good relationships. Our approach to engaging with the tribes helps the, helps the BLM identify cultural values, religious beliefs, and traditional practices, not to mention the legal rights of Native American people, 
all of which may be affected by BLM actions on public lands. To the west of Bears Ears in northwestern New Mexico is a place called Chaco Culture National Historical Park, or Chaco Canyon for short. It's managed by the Park Service and is one of the world's most unique culturally significant landscapes. Located in the high desert, this valley served as the center for Chacoan culture for roughly 400 years, from 850 to 1250. The sophistication of this culture is clearly visible in the grand scale of the architecture set in the landscape of sacred mountains and mesas, shrines that have deep spiritual meaning for their descendants to this day. The park captures some of the truly significant sites, but the broader Chaco landscape is full of artifacts and culture. It's also a really important high desert habitat. Much of it is BLM managed land. The area is also rich in mineral deposits, oil and gas specifically. And as oil and gas development continued to encroach toward the park, Secretary Holland proposed a mineral withdrawal to create a 10 mile buffer around the park. Excuse the legalese here. A mineral withdrawal is when the Secretary of Interior removes the ability for anyone to lease those minerals, withdraws them from the pool of minerals that are available to be leased. The President and the Secretary announced this proposal late last fall. We're conducting the environmental analysis now. And because we understand that the value of the greater Chaco landscape extends even beyond the 10 mile buffer, at the BLM we're engaging with the tribes in a process called honoring Chaco to learn from Pueblos and the Navajo on how best to manage the landscape while preserving the Chaco culture. What we learn from this process will inform our future land management plans and decisions. And one more example, to the north in Alaska, where subsistence takes on its literal meaning. We're working hard to ensure that Alaska Natives can continue to live with and off the land. I had the remarkable fortune of visiting there a couple months ago with Secretary Holland. We visited Ukiovic on the Arctic Slope, and the community there was jubilant, literally welcoming the Secretary with song and dance not only because she was visiting, but because at 3 a.m. that morning they had harvested a whale just off the ice in this photo. But days later in the central Yukon, she was presented with an empty Ziploc bag. Normally the Ziploc is full of dried salmon, a commonplace gift, but the bag was empty. Last year's harvest was too small. The Bureau has complicated, beautiful mandates to provide for multiple uses and to ensure sustained yield. In an era of climate change, that mission becomes all the more complicated and all the more important. If we don't manage for resiliency in our landscapes, health in our landscapes, then we will not be able to deliver on the sustained yield mission in the future. We will fail the future and each other. There's lots to talk about there. It's my narrative thread, if you will, for my time at the Bureau. It tugs on everything, from oil and gas de deposits to renewable energy, from grazing to wild horses. But I'm going to focus the rest of my remarks on what many of you are grappling with here, how to ensure that we don't love these lands to death. And at the same time, we paradoxically have to ensure they remain accessible to everyone that the size of our bank, account, bank accounts never dictates our ability to access our public lands. We go to our public lands for so many region, reasons, to fish, to seek solace, to fill our freezers, to walk, to bike, to ride ATVs, to camp with our families, to pray. Sometimes when I'm walking along my home creek, I hear Richard Hugo from the river we carry with us, quote, the cruel things I did, I took to the river. I begged the current, make me better, unquote. There are infinite reasons we go. And our job at the BLM is to make sure that when you go, when you seek those sacred lands and waters, you're not turned away by crowds or degraded landscapes. 
As an agency, we manage so many hidden gems, 651 wilderness and wilderness study areas totaling over 21 million acres, as well as wild and scenic river stretches that span almost 2,700 miles. Closest to home and the heart of this conference, the Blackfoot River carves its way to the Clark Fork through BLM-managed lands in the Blackfoot River Corridor. The BLM lands people tend to seek are our national conservation lands across the West, about 35 million acres in total. These lands are one of America's most unique systems of conservation, designated by either the President or Congress to conserve special features. They contain some of the West's most spectacular landscapes and provide unparalleled recreational opportunities for everyone. They are spectacular and diverse places that give Americans exceptional opportunities for hunting, fishing, solitude, birding, as you heard yesterday, exploring history, scientific research, and a wide range of traditional uses. So one of the core priorities of this administration is outlined in President Biden's America the Beautiful initiative, which centers on, yes, collaborative conservation and expanding access to our public lands, making outdoor recreation accessible to all Americans, regardless of who they are and where they live. It's also an initiative that sets the ambitious goal to conserve 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. John Muir once wrote that, quote, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world, unquote. Fragmented, isolated parcels of land break down these natural connections, diminishing their value for both people and wildlife. And that fragmentation also makes it hard to get around. If you've spent any time in the West, you know that the way it was settled creates just a host of access issues. Much of the West is managed in a checkerboard pattern of alternating federal, state, and private ownership. The reference is literal. It's called a checkerboard because it looks just like one on a map, which means that much of the land that we manage is inaccessible to the public unless access is specifically granted by the neighboring owner. That's why we're working hard to open up access to these lands, connect and consolidate them into contig contiguous blocks for the public. Pretty happy to report that we're making pretty good progress in this direction. Just two weeks ago, we approved the acquisition of more than 35,000 acres along the North Platte River, about 25 miles outside of Casper, Wyoming. The purchase will enable us to connect another 30,000 acres of isolated BLM lands and 10,000 acres of state lands, opening up over 75,000 acres to all of us. It's a win-win for the seller, too. The family kept a small portion of the ranch, and they'll be the permittee to graze on the lands they sold to us. We acquired those lands with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And for those of you not familiar, this program is our best tool in the federal government to open up access to, protect, and share public lands with the American people. Again, close to this conference, it's the program we're using to purchase former industrial lands up in the Blackfoot. And thanks to funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Great American Outdoors Act, we can put people to work on our public lands, restoring them and, and fixing the maintenance backlog uh, that has been there for decades. In 2020, Congress made the land and water conservation a permanent and permanently funded program. In a truly polarized time in our country, 92 senators voted to pass this legislation. This is proof that our public lands still have the power to unite us. So with this permanent program, we're make, working to make real strides in ensuring that American lands are accessible for everyone, no matter where they live. And we're crowdsourcing that work. The same time Congress made the Land and Water Conservation Fund permanent, they asked us to go to the public and have them identify parcels that are important to them that they can't get to. And boy, did people respond. Our sister agencies got a, a handful, a couple dozen nominations each. We got 6,000. And after months of work, looking at every single one of those nominations, we whittled that list down to parcels that cover three and a half million acres across a dozen states in the West. It's a pretty solid list from which to work as we continue 
the Land and Water Conservation Fund program with that permanent funding. It's really gratifying and important work. And one reason we're succeeding is because of people like you insisting on it, insisting on those 92 Senate votes, insisting that we leave these lands better off than we found them. So I'll let the next panel kick around whether a book can save a wilderness. I'd argue that it's people who do that. But I do know that words matter. The pen as a sword, as an instrument of justice, matters. I've seen it at every stage of my career. People gathering, using their voices, rising to match the scenery, as well as Stegner might have hoped. Norman McLean was fortunate enough to fish the Blackfoot River before the Mike Horse tailings dam gave way in 1974, before the trout were nearly wiped out. It was his hallowed words and the sheer force and power of the river itself that inspired a cadre of people to work hard to bring the Blackfoot back, to ranch with people and trout and wildlife in mind, to keep a gold mine out of its headwaters to remove a dam at its confluence. The bull trout are back, the cutthroat are back, and now the BLM and Montana's Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department have a whole set of other problems to solve because of it, better problems. Words matter. They are the cornerstone of the foundation for the rest of the work. Speaking of the rest of the work, I barely touched on it here, so I'm gonna turn the mic over to you all. Um, I'm happy to take questions about, about the BLM and the work ahead. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a real honor. I think he's saying we have time for <laughs> some questions. <laughs> Surely. Terry. Terry has a question. Oh, Terry. Yep, I can. So Terry's question is, after the, uh, the president last week wrote a letter to some CEOs of oil and gas companies asking for their help given the war in Ukraine, um, and how does that affect our uh, leasing uh, program on oil and gas, or for oil and gas on BLM lands? Um, and the answer, Terry, is it's hard. Um, the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 doesn't give us a lot of um, room. I often say to my colleagues in my job, our laws don't fully suit our times anymore. They, they just don't. <laughs> um, so back to those 92 senators, please do your work. Uh, you all do your work in, um, in convincing them to give us a better set of laws from which to work. We are in the midst of um, uh, being told by a judge in the Fifth Circuit in Louisiana in the Louisiana v. Biden case uh, that we have to lease. Um, so we are uh, looking at what will be the first uh, lease, the oil and gas lease sale. It's been out for public comment. Um, it started at 700,000 acres. It's now down to 140, likely to go a little bit below that uh, once, we, uh, once we put it out for lease. Um, but the answer is, it's hard. And I'll compare that to uh, previous presidents. I'm going to get this wrong, but both President Trump and President Obama in their first two years uh, leased well over a million, pushing two million acres. This will be our first set of acres. We have a question here. You speak up. I'll repeat it if we can't hear it. Oh, we got a Thank you. Um, 
The BLM has been reported as uh, perhaps the most demoralized public agency during the Trump years. And um, that's not something that obviously can be cured overnight. But I'm wondering uh, what you're doing to rebuild the agency. Um, I, I'm thinking about also the move from uh, out of Washington, D.C. of the national headquarters and the impact that that had. Uh, I wonder if you could address the steps that you're taking. And for, well, first of all, how are you finding the agency now after uh, the tumultuous, devastating impact of the last uh, four years? And then uh, what do you see for the future? Thanks for the question. Um, it's, it's the biggest part of the work and the way to have the most durable, lasting change is how we rebuild that agency. Um, and the people, I, I, you know, we live in a time where it's hard to work for the government and a BLM uh, staffers especially live in really rough rural places. Um, they are not always welcome there um, and they are never told thank you enough. And so simply telling the people that I work with and for thank you is uh, lands in lovely ways. Um, I, it's not okay how they were treated. Uh, that those career staffers who've given 30 and 40 years of their lives deserve better. Our communities deserve better. The landscape sure as heck deserves better. Uh, and so we're working to rebuild it. Um, we're hiring. <laughs> Uh, go to us. Go to usajobs.gov, and as Terry uh, asked us for all earlier, go find those people that you are mentoring and tell them to go to usajobs.gov um, because it is beautiful, important work. Um, and we are moving the headquarters back from Grand Junction to Washington, D.C. It's, um, it's very clear that we, the headquarters needs to be there. It's where the nation convenes uh, both its power and its decision making. And 97% of BLM uh, staff are in the field already anyway, as they should be. Up in the, up in the balcony. Yay. Um, I'm going to go back to the court. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I hope folk, I do understand your question. Um, uh, so there are, you're right, there are 20 million acres in this country under lease for oil and gas development. Only 10 million of them are currently being used. There are 9,000 unused applications to drill, basically the permit that you get once you lease land. Um, so there's lots of options existing already. Um, coming back to uh, how our laws don't quite suit our times, uh, the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 did not envision that question and that conundrum. Um, so we are sorting our way, sorting our way through it. There's uh, some good uh, proposed laws before Congress that would cut off um, speculation of leasing that I think would be really helpful to us. We have um, some ability at the agency to do some rulemakings that would also help um, uh, tamp down on speculative leasing, um, and we're working on that rulemaking as we speak. Uh, so when it becomes public, please raise your voices. Um, but uh, it comes right back to the two words, it's hard. We got time, unfortunately, for one more question. I see just in the to middle. try and get back oh, on wait. schedule. Okay, I'm gonna throw you a total curveball. okay? <laughs> 
There's been, t thank you first of all for being here. Thank you for everything that you do. There's been talk in the last couple of weeks, um, and this has to do with the SCOTUS ruling. Um, taking Could you away, put the mic a little closer? Taking there? away the rights of women and um, reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. About the possibility of using public land to um, put clinics on in order to have abortions available to the public. And this is not, it's not me. I didn't, it's not me. Seriously, it's in the news. Yes, AOC was talking about it yesterday. And so I just wanted to see if you had a response to that. Um, it was, I think, Senator Warner, uh, Warren threw, tossed out that idea. Uh, and, you know, once again, we have the ability to do very, uh, what you would not normally think um, things on public lands like um, through a, um, a law called RRP uh, where communities can lease land from us to build a firehouse, to build a YWCA, to, um, so there's mechanisms to use our public lands for the good of communities. Um, and I'll be very curious to see how the uh, Congress chooses to expand or not um, our ability uh, to allow certain activities on public lands. Um, I tell you the one thing that I am worried about, about the future, um, as we begin to, as we continue to, for example, um, occasionally sell public lands to communities that are bursting across this, uh, bursting at the seams in the West so that there can be things like affordable housing. It's the right thing to do. But at some point, there's a tipping point. Um, and uh, at some point, we have to figure out how to build up instead of out uh, so that we still pass along this unbelievable asset, um, really uked, unique to America, uh, to the future, so they get to enjoy it like we do. Thank you again, everybody, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you.